Well, now the prophet, you know, this is a synth that it was, it, I guess it was the first memory synth that I had. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the first uh, proper memory synth anyone really could have had, um, though the four voice did have its programmer uh, that is somewhat similar to Prophet 5, really um, made everything programmable. What four voice? The Oberheim four voice. Because that has a programmer module oh. where you can save okay. certain offsets. It's more of an offset programmer than anything, right. whereas this is fully programmable. Yeah, fully programmable, and I could put it on top of the Fender Rhodes and like do a gig and like call mm -hmm. up sounds, and that was like pretty. I thought this is the future. You can have an organ, a clavinet, and a piano, and it all sounds off. You know. Yeah. Didn't really end up being used that way. You know, I ended up just making synth sounds on it, but it's it sure holds up though. It, it sounds definitely does. great now, yes. with, uh, next to anything. Absolutely. It's, it's extremely relevant even today, actually, especially today. This is a very special Prophet 5. This is the 14th Prophet 5 ever made. It's a Rev 1. Um, I had Dave Smith sign it uh, at SynthPlex 2019, uh, and I'm uh, very honored that he did so, and honored that I got to know him a little bit uh, before he unfortunately passed. I actually got to help him repair his own Rev 3 Prophet 5, um, when they were preparing for the reissue, which was extremely awkward to, uh, to answer questions about repairing something to the person who quite literally created it. Extremely awkward. Um, but great guy. Um, so this is... Uh, Says a lot, though. It does, I think. Thank you. Uh, but this is, uh, again, a Rev 1 Prophet 5, so it looks a little bit different than the later ones, and I wanted to bust out the Rev 1 so I could really show... Um, not just the, the next stage in synthesis and how that looks inside, right. but uh, the earliest of that stage, quite literally. This would yeah. have been made by Dave Smith in his garage. Um, so, and it looks a little different. Like these, this knob isn't on the later one and that knob and the, the that's power right. switch is in a different spot. The right? power switch is up here to tune knob, or sorry, the volume's up here instead of over here, like on the later ones. Um, and yeah, you have the preset switches, though with the firmware that's in this, it bypasses all that, so you can actually twist the knob and it changes. Back then, you had to press the preset button in order to actually edit certain sections of the like synthesizer. Like on an OBX. Or, exactly, yeah. just like on an OBX, but they kind of ripped that off from this, of course. Again, why we busted this out, because everything after this is kind of based on this. This kind of started it off. Even like the, the Oberheim OBX, OBXA, Absolutely. and OBA? The, the, the pr parts are in, that are in this could easily go into an OB8 or an OBX or really anything. So would you say Dave Smith really was like was like a seminal like innovation? Without with... question. Without question. Yeah, he took the idea of a microcontroller based and t fully programmable instrument that no one else was doing and he did it. Amazing. All that stuff that was yeah. in a CS80, all those wires and little cities Yes, of course, this has no dynamics. It's just note on or off. There's no aftertouch. There's no velocity. Um, so it is missing that, but, um, you know, everything else mm -hmm. is fully programmable. Now, the MIDI came later, right? You didn't mm -hmm. have MIDI at the beginning of, of Prophet 5. That's right, and there's no MIDI in this either. Uh, there was a factory MIDI for the Rev 3 towards the end of its production, um, but these earlier ones, there was no way to add MIDI until today, uh, where are there, there are now some retrofits. Yeah, yeah. All right, well now, the unveiling. Well, the unveiling. I'll show you how uh, miles of wire gets condensed Weird. into a couple ribbons. And it doesn't look anything like what I'm used to. Let's be very careful. It's very precarious in its service position. Um, so, starting over here, you have your Z80, which is nicely tucked under this board that has to do with auto-tune, because uh, these synths actually fully calibrate themselves. Old. Not fully, just the oscillators. You hit the tune button over here. Oh, sorry, that's on a Rev 2. On a Rev 1, you have to press 1 and 8 at the same time to make it tune itself. And it'll automatically calibrate the oscillators and bring it as close to in tune as possible because these are never in tune. Um, but basically, all the switches and all the pots are bust through this connector right here. And uh, then it's read by this various set of digital circuitry over here and turns it into a real control voltages which go to this analog board. So this is the, the innovative thing right here? This is the innovative thing all right here. All of this is kind of the same that you end up before and after, really. So what's happening here? What, what's like it replacing? What is it all, what's it doing in this small area? Tone spider. Um, <laughs> what it's doing is, uh, you know, it, it's providing a, a firmware to, to the uh, 
to, to the controls really. So it's it's scanning the keyboard for key presses and it's turning those key presses into voice assignments and uh, and control voltages where necessary. So of course for the oscillator there's a control voltage, it might send a control voltage to the filter, gates for the envelopes and all that kind of stuff. But in this section specifically it's storing the actual um, parameters. So in these, this over here is mm -hmm. the RAM section and um, it's battery back. There's the battery right here. And um, yeah, whenever you save a program, it's saved onto one of these chips and those chips fail all the time, let me tell you. Um, and then here is your three ROMs. These are where the actual software is. Uh, so you could update it later if they fixed any bugs, which for this they really didn't. Um, and uh, there should be scratch pad RAM somewhere, but I don't know where it is at this moment. And that would be noting the actual real time uh -huh. um, scratch pad, like the manual mode, essentially. Uh, you have interfacing stuff here, which kind of interfaces with all this stuff to assign, you know, the, the chips enables and all the things for these various chips, because they all are basically running in parallel. Um, and then over here, you have a DAC. Um, so this you know, converts all the, the digital stuff into analog and then So gets, it's digital up to he, through here? It's through here, digital, really, it's all digital. All the way, so for sure digital here. Mm -hmm. And these are replacing all those cards like that were all dedicated on the yeah. CS80, right? And then it's able to discreetly spit it out to the right analog That's things right. via this DAC. And then it goes through this DAC. And then, You're, I'm actually understanding yeah. it. Yeah, there's signal flow from left to right, right? So then after the DAC, that gets into these uh, 4051 multiplexers, and that's demult in a demultiplex fashion where it's then sampling and holding those values into these various buffers, uh, what's called a voltage follower, and these are the capacitors that hold the voltage. So it's basically re spitting out the voltage that the pot is at multiple, you know, many, many times per second, and this capacitor is holding that mm. voltage. And when these caps fail, of course, then you have problems. And yeah. these op amps fail. Well, everything in this thing fails. It's a very early product. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, that's your filter CV, your key CV, everything, the LFO rate. It's all being spit out numerous times per second um, through this into these capacitors. And then there's actually even more circuitry behind this analog board. And then the miles and miles of wire you see in the CS80 is all replaced with this uh, 50 position ribbon cable right here. Oh. And that just goes from here to here. Uh, this being a Rev1, one interesting thing to note is that there's a second ribbon right here. And you'll see nylon standoffs on the analog board because all of them had the ability to be turned into a Profit 10. Um, and that's how you would expand the voices through there. Oh. And uh, they discontinued that very early on because it's extremely unstable due to heat. Um, and the bottom board just gets totally baked. Um, so they stopped doing that, but they left all the hardware in it. And this being number 14, definitely they had the idea that it could be a Profit 10 at some point. Uh, and then you have your analog board, which receives all these control voltages and also makes even more of its own. There's more multiplexing going on. Mm -hmm. You have all your envelope chips here. Those are all SSM-based envelopes. There's more under the ribbon. Um, here's all your oscillators with nice goopy Tempco resistors, which sense the temperature and compensate um, a little bit. Uh, they're very unstable, even with that. You see all this green wiring. This is all what's called kludge wire, Kynar wire. Um, and that's because they ran out of uh, routing spaces on the board, or in this case, they needed to add buffers. Um, because things were dragging other things down. So they add these buffers and they tack onto the chip below it. So there's actually chips below this. It's pretty raunchy, all things considered, as far as synth design goes, these Rev 1s. But they are amazing nonetheless. Did he sort that out later? There's more space. The Rev 2, they didn't sort it out quite as much. Uh, but in, by the time uh, the Rev 3, which is what you have, by the time that came along, it was a lot less of this, much more refined. But also a completely different sound. You know, these original Profit 5s are all SSM based. And uh, that's just a different chip manufacturer. But they were so unstable, they had to switch. You like you know? the, how they sound better? I don't like how they sound better. Uh, they definitely sound different. And they do sound cool. And they do sound good. Um, but I wouldn't say one's mm -hmm. better than the other, really. The Rev 3 definitely works a lot better than the Rev 1. And it sounds see. its own good form of good. So. That, that's the classic Profit 5 sound, ultimately. Yeah. You know, all the big hits that were Profit 5. It's all Rev3, Rev except for, you know, like, um, was that Yellow Magic Orchestra? That's all, Rev1 and 2. Yeah, to Rev1 and 2. Okay. Yeah. And so, m most of the stuff, so you have the, 
the Z80, is that what you mm -hmm. The Z80 okay. microprocessor. And then it gets converted around here into analog, and then you have oscillators and filters and VCAs. Uh, oscillators and filters and VCAs are all over here. These are all just the control voltages for all of For them. Yeah. Okay, so it turns and into the analog land here. That's right. And, and then, then behind here, you actually have the LFO, which is on its own oscillator chip. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so the control voltage for that would be over here as well. So just, <coughs> what are those? Like, where, where are the oscillators and the filters and the... So these are the envelopes. VCAs. We'll start here just because it's towards the left. So the SSM 2050, though they may be marked differently because they, um, you Shaking. know, they had, they had chip fabs back then. And sometimes they didn't want to uh -huh. go through the extra expense of actually marking the chips. Um, but those would be SSM 2050s. There'd be 10 of those, five for the filter envelope and five for the amp envelope. And then over here, you have your oscillators. Um, these are the SSM 2030, and they have this fun, goopy cludge on top of it where it has a resistor, and then under that, what's mm. called a temperature compensating resistor. And those are glued to the top of the chip, um, which is something you have to account for when you're changing them, makes it all the more complicated. Towards the right, you then have um, the various VCAs that feed, for example, the oscillator level into their respective filters. The filters are the SSM 2040, um, and it's a very revered filter, very nice filter in this thing, um, very hot resonance. And then after that, you have your VCA, which I believe is based on the SSM uh, 2020. So what's the Curtis chip right, that I always hear about? What's the that? Curtis chip is what you'd find in the Rev 3 Profit 5. Oh, so I won't see that here. You will not see that here, though. We could open another one if you like. That's but. okay. So that's what makes it sound a little different. Right? Yes. One of the things. Much here. different. Much different. The these these do sound much different. This is a, besides looking about the same, they are completely different inside. And is Oberheim, do, do, does Oberheim use anything in Curtis? Uh, the OBX used Curtis envelopes, and then the rest of them use Curtis uh, filters, uh, oscillators, okay. and envelopes. They did. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's no, nothing wrong with Curtis chips. You know, there's a lot of internet lore as to whether they're worse than SSM for some reason, but they're fine. Yeah. They sound great. It's a classic sound. Okay, and then these wires here are like related to the keyboard, you know, depressions. So they send a like it. I guess it's touching. It's touching what's called a bus bar. So I those are what's that. called J wires. This is the J wire, right? Yeah, and, and that it touches, touches this the, bus bar. That's right, and these are all what's in, in what's called a matrix. So um, so all of these, you know, it, it the first keys connected through a series of diodes to a key eight keys later. And then those are, and then these all have a common bus, one per eight keys, and I think the last one has its own. Um, and then that converts into basically 16 different connections right here, and mm -hmm. that gets bussed into the panel board, actually, which has a chip that just scans the keyboard for key presses and various combinations. Wow. And that prevented them from needing 61 different, or I guess actually 122 different switches, connections, and cables to for the thing to read. This just makes it happen in a scanning fashion. But so you could theoretically go too fast for it to actually recognize your key press. Play too fast. But you'd have to play be playing very, very fast. But if I play <laughs> six notes, it, it knows like to, because it's only five notes. Software knows. The software knows that, there's, software that knows. there's no more possible notes. So these wires will send out info from all the notes that I play, and then the mm -hmm. software will say, no, you were last, so you get... Oh, it goes so much deeper than that. I mean, it'll say, okay, you hit middle C, and I need to send that to voice number one. And also because I can auto tune myself, if you're sending the middle C to voice four, we need to add 0 0.014 volts onto no. that so that it's in tune. It'll fix it. Yeah, it'll fix it. It knows that when you hit the key, it goes through a whole table of that and internally. This, this that's all held there. That's yeah. where it's telling. So yeah, things. so it'll so it'll store the the offsets that it reads in RAM or that it okay. created really in RAM. So it'll know, okay, if you're over here and you press that key right. and it's going to this specific voice, then we need to add or subtract this much voltage for it to be in. So it's so innovative because it's Extremely not, it's innovative. doing so many things. Because that's one thing that uh, you you did not see in the CS80 is its ability to tune itself. It, it, yeah. You know, once it's out of tune, you have to have someone calibrate. It's kind of fixing it. I mean, yeah. not only is it doing memory and telling everything what to do and controlling the voltage probably a lot more accurately, mm -hmm. like from voice to voice, you have less anomalies, right? That's right. Like mm -hmm. with the CS80, there are still some, especially in these earlier ones. There's even more, but like in the Rev3, you know, the tuning's rock solid. It's amazing. Sure. In these, it's a little looser, but it's still. But good. less than the CS80, Much obviously. Less. Yeah. And then you still have the character, and then it's going to be doing like things like that, like tuning itself and getting. Well, I don't know. That's just a. 
how does he come up with this? Was it was it a chip that was used for something else at that time? You know, uh, uh, home computers, really. That's what it was. Yeah. And he was able to just figure out a way to like have it be the the brain center to like distribute voltages correctly mm -hmm. to these guys, and then these guys send those voltages to the same kind of chips as a CS80. That's analog, like yeah, um, analog oscillators, v VCFs, VCAs, envelope generators. And well, I think I got a little bit of uh, knowledge. <laughs> I mean, I would never have known this. You know, who's going to open this stuff up? But I think, like, what can it do for me? I think besides having an appreciation more, you know, about how the synth is made, it, it makes me think a little bit differently when I make a sound. And it seems like it's like a little bit intangible, but I like sort of, I like knowing that. You know, I, I think that it might make me explore things more from like a voltage point of view mm -hmm. and not just, you know, because when I, you could think like, oh, this is a bright knob, and then you just think like treble bass, mm -hmm. you know? But if you think of it in terms of this, it's just like having more than one way to look at sculpting a sound, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, like if you're Michelangelo, you could use a hammer and a chisel, and that's one way to do it, but you could also sort of brush things off, you know? So it just affects the way you create, so. It, I'll tell you one thing, it definitely affects the way I play synthesizers because I know how they work inside. It's like when I'm on my memory mode especially because it's so haphazard with this kind of stuff, it's like I'm going to press this button and it's going to make every oscillator three low frequency, but is it going to this time? <laughs> right. You know, because I know how many different 4016 switches it's switching, you know? Right. And uh, it's a, it's, it kind of makes it less fun and more fun at the same time. Um, but, I mean, it, 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 is a, it is amazing. My favorite thing is that they can send that series of voltages to these three different chips and that can in you know the speed of light basically spit that out to these various places basically without skipping a beat yeah um, it's pretty amazing because you got this analog stuff that was from the previous you know era and then these guys are like talk to it mm -hmm. and via like the later era which is the computer but it's like it's in reverse it's not like the computer's at the end, mm -hmm. right? It's got, it goes to the computer, to the translator guys, to you the... You have to think about it as more of a loop. It's a, it's a full circuit. Because it comes loop. back around. Because it comes back, because it can, it's also listening to itself, to correct Right, itself. to do the, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I guess so, I guess so. So it's, it's really alive in that way. It really is. And these especially, these definitely, you breathe on these and you'll know how alive they are. And maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe artificial intelligence gets introduced into this and then it become even you know, more more of a loop it where it just kind of is almost like an art, like a primitive AI. You know, right? It can predict primitive. What, what needs to happen. Do you think that the future <laughs> of synthesizers, like having AI in, into something like this, would? I think that's actually the problem. I think that the problem with a lot of modern stuff, even when they code it to try to behave more like this, is that you really want the filters to be slightly imperfect mm -hmm. you know and when you press the calibrate on a newer profit five or the profit six or something it's tuning every range of notes on every filter to be perfect yeah and that um that's cool but you know the reason we like analog is because it's, it's a little bit more alive it might be just slightly darker on one voice in the bottom than on the top when you have keyboard tracking right. on and even you know too much is a problem but that little bit of variance is, is what makes analog synthesis so special. Yeah, you need it. Like when you watch dancers, you don't want all the dancers to be the same person. Mm -hmm. You want each dancer to be a unique personality dancing together. That's right. But something to look at. And then their ears are kind of the same thing. It gives you more to hear. That's right. That's, that's what it is. We, we, we pick it up.